Hi there, welcome back. In today's class, we will deal with interest rates and in particular with the risk management of interest rates. As risk managers, we are indeed very much interested in the impact that a variation in the interest rates in the yield may have on our portfolio. To do that, we will need particular tools like duration and convexity. We will see that duration is nothing more than a function of that row, that Greek, that we discussed very briefly last time. Today we have an entire class on that. Before introducing duration and convexity, I will cover some basic information related to interest rates, and we will also deal with the so-called asset liability mismatch, a very important a phenomenon, a very important topic for banks. I hope you will enjoy this class. Okay, so last time we we started by considering the, the Greeks as first risk measures used by the front office to deal with what we will later define as market risk. Among the Greeks, we have considered the first row, so delta, gamma, theta, rho, and vega. And if you remember, last time we dealt together with uh, gamma, with the delta, and with vega. But we said that, for example, for what concerns theta is not particularly interesting for us as risk managers. It is in other fields of finance, but not particularly for us. And I told you that for the fifth one, the row, we would have a specific class. And this is the class. So what we will discuss today is essentially how to very briefly, because we don't have the time, deal with interest rates risk. So the risk that is related to changes in the interest rates and the fact that virtually all portfolios are affected by interest rates. Now, before that, we will have a very quick review of, of interest rates, of what we need to know about interest rates, uh, and then we will actually enter into the, the real risk management part. Now, when we speak about interest rates, we are speaking about a rather complicated object. Why? If you think of whatever type of market variable you can play with, like prices, like volatility, uh, like exchange rates, and then you compare all those market variables with interest rates, the first, thing, like the first thing that you observe is that for interest rates, we have several interest rates. We have several definitions of interest rates. So we have treasury interest rates, mortgage interest rate, deposit interest rates, GOPs, lending, whatever you want, the interbanking sector. And we have interest rates on different maturities. If I change my time horizon, I will have different interest rates. <coughs> now, the problem then, when you deal with interest rates, is that most of the time you are not just playing with one quantity, but you are playing with a set of quantities. That's why when we speak about interest rates, typically we do not just play with one interest rate, but we play with the so-called yield curve that we will uh, define in, in a minute. Another important characteristic of interest rates is the fact that even if they are necessarily because of the way in which our markets are structured, because of the way in which the regulators regulate the market, so the central banks, for example, there is a strong dependence among interest rates. But what is important to stress is that it's very rare to observe a bunch of interest rates that are perfectly monotonic. And you see that I have underlined the word on the slides. Monotonic in probabilistic sense means that there is a perfect positive dependence among random variables. It means that if some of the random variables increase, all the others will also increase. Maybe we are not able to say exactly how much, but they move in the same direction. Now, co-monotonicity is extremely important in risk management for different reasons. 
it can be positive in a sense that it simplifies a lot of formulas. We will see that Bennett risk, one of the measures that we consider together in this course, is not coherent according to a definition of coherence that we will give, but it becomes coherent, so it gains a lot of properties when the portfolio that we are dealing with is commonotonic. But at the same time, from a practical point of view, commonotonicity is something that you should not want to have in your portfolio unless it answers a specific question that you need for your portfolio. Why? Because if you have a commonotonic portfolio, it means that essentially you are not able to diversify risk because all the assets move in the same direction. So if you have a loss in one, very high chance you will have losses in the others. So you are not diversifying, which is actually one of the basic things you should do in risk management. So let's say something about interest rates first, and let's then enter into the management of interest rate risks. Now, very basic things that you all know for sure is the notion of compounding. There are different types of compounding on the market. Now, imagine that we have a certain amount that I call X, we don't care, and we invest this amount over time for N years from now, okay? And there is an interest rate per annum, so a yearly interest rate of R. If we have a yearly compounding, or the, our interest is compounded once per annum, and with compounding we mean that we have the capital, we invest the capital, at the end of the year we get our capital and the interest, and we reinvest the capital and the interest. So that at the end of the second year, I will gain interest on the capital and on the previous interest, and so on. This is what compounding means. So if I have yearly compounding at the end of our investment, so at the end of the end years, I will have what? X, initial capital, times one, obviously the capital itself, and then the interest. So x1 plus r to the power of n. Why? Because I'm compounding, I'm reinvesting the capital and the interest. I'm rolling over the investment. Now, this is the simplest type of compounding we can think of. We can have also other type of compoundings, the, for example, the so-called frequency compounding. Now, the fact is that, for example, I have my interest R, but my interest is computed every month, okay, or every three months, or every six months. So, I introduce a quantity N that essentially tells me the frequency of the compounding, and now the formula becomes X, X that multiplies 1 plus R divided by M, everything to the power of mn. Now, if you take n equal to 1, you have the so-called equivalent annual interest, okay? Because you are removing the, the frequency part. Now, if you are a little bit <coughs> familiar with mathematics, you should recognize that if I take n, and I take n going to infinity, so I take the limit for n going to infinity, what I'm actually doing, I'm saying that, for example, I'm compounding every second, every nanosecond, every picosecond, capital and interest. And I'm computing again the interest on the capital and the interest that I've already accumulated. If I do that, I get the limit expression for m tending to infinity, which is just the exponential. So, if I have the so-called continuous compounding, it's like I'm continuously, in terms of time, compounding my interest in capital, I get x to the power, uh, x times e rn, so the exponential of rn at the end of my investment at maturity, so at the end of the end period. In this course, unless differently specified, as we always do in finance, we play with continuous compounding. Okay, so when you are said that there is some sort of compounding, you can safely assume that it is continuous compounding, unless you are said this is frequency compounding. Okay, so 
if I have compounding, I also have discounting. Why? I have a certain amount of money in one year from now, in three years from now, in five years from now, and I want to know what's the value today. That is to say, what would be the amount today that invested at a given interest rate gives me in one year, two years, any years, depending on the time horizon, exactly the amount I'm considering. Now, on the market, there are a lot of products that are related to interest rates. Again, I told you virtually all products are related to interest rates, but there are a specific number of products that are explicitly on interest rates. Bonds, for example. Okay? Within the big family of bonds that you have seen in the other courses of this minor, we just consider two very simple situations the zero coupon bond and the coupon bond. A zero coupon bond is an investment, is a bond that pays no coupon. It means that I make my investment at time zero and I get my capital and my interest back at the end of the period. A one year zero coupon bond is a bond that I buy today and one year from now will pay back capital and interest. In the meantime, nothing happens. Okay? If I have a, a coupon bond, conversely, so if I have, for example, a coupon bond that pays a coupon every month, at the end of the period, I will get my capital back and interest, but also at the end of every month, within, I will get a coupon. So a small amount of money that obviously will be a function of the interest rate. If I consider coupon bonds, uh, zero coupon bonds on the, on the market, so bonds that don't pay coupon with different maturities, and I consider the interest rates that are essentially given by these uh, zero coupon bonds, I get what, what uh, we typically call the zero rates. The zero rate is the interest rate paid by a specific zero coupon bond over a given time horizon. Now, imagine that I'm in this sector. I have a certain number of maturities, and I express the maturities as it is convention in, in years. So I have six months, 0 0.5, one year, one, 18 months or 1.5 years, and two years. Looking at the corresponding zero coupon bonds, that is to say the, the zero coupon bond that will pay <coughs> over six months, over one year, over one year and a half, and so on, I get the corresponding zero rates you see 4%, 4.8, 5.2, and 5.5. Now, looking at this table, we immediately have all, or at least a very simple approximation, of what we need to define the so-called yield curve. You can give very complicated definitions of the yield curve, very sophisticated mathematical definitions of the yield curve that I love to give to my students at the master, in particular during the exam, but actually it's a very trivial and simple object. It's something of this type. So I just drew a graph in which on the x-axis I put the, the maturities, <laughs> And on the y-axis, I put the corresponding zero rates. Okay, now look at the plot. We are, we are today, this is time zero for us, and then we have 0 0.5 here, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, and 2. Okay, these are our, these are our, maturities in the table, and now what I do is just to draw the line that essentially connects all the points I can derive from the table. So for 0 0.5, I have more or less 4%, so let's say that this is 4%, then I have 4.8, that would be, say, here, then I have 5.2, a little bit closer, 5.2, and then I will have 5.5. And then I do all my usual stuff to try to get a decent drawing. 
And if I connect these points, I will have this. This, then it will be this, this, this. This object here is what we call the yield curve. Now, you, you see that here we just have four points, okay? Imagine that we have a more dense and granular set of maturities. So we have, for example, one month, we have three months, we have uh, four months, we have, I don't know, uh, two and a half years, five years, and so on. So that we have much a better representation in terms of points, and my line becomes a little bit smoother because I will have obviously more interpolations to perform. And assuming the limit that I have all the maturities, this line will actually become uh, a curve. Now, <coughs> what happens, for example, from this line if I want to understand <coughs> what can be possibly Actually, there are more uh, formal and efficient ways of doing that. But already from this line, for example, I can imagine that if I'm looking for a contract that is, for example, three months long, say here, more or less the interest rate will be in this area. Okay? In order to be consistent with this yield curve. And imagine that. On the market, obviously it's not true, on the market you get a lot of maturities, up to 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But imagine that I want to know what can be possibly, if it is meaningful to me, what can be the interest rate in 18 years from now. What can I do? I can try to extend the curve, and there are specific techniques to do that. So I project the curve in the future, and I try to make inference about future interest rates. These type of things are extremely important and there is a lot of mathematical modeling behind this. For example, from a mathematical, financial mathematical point of view, the model of interest rates is actually a very, very big and hot topic. And banks and financial institutions are investing rivers of money on, on that. But for us, it is just sufficient to recall that the yield curve is nothing more than this graphical representation of the structure of maturities and corresponding zero rates. This is what we call the zero rate curve. Obviously, if you, if you change the type of interest rate, you can have another type of yield curve. But this is one of the fundamental ones. Now, as I was telling you before, we have zero coupon bonds, that is to say bonds that don't pay a coupon, but uh, a big deal of bonds out there are essentially coupon bonds. They pay something during their life. So between today, when we enter in the contract and maturity, I get some money uh, every month, every two months, depending on the type of coupon. So periodically, I get money from the, from the, from the bond. Uh, what is important is that in a coupon bond, what I get during the life of the bond is never the face value, is never the par value of the coupon, but only the coupon. The capital, the face value, will be paid back only at maturity. In, an, in standard bonds, on the OTC, if you want, on the all the counter market, if you can, and if you want to invent a new bond, feel free to do that. But in standard bonds, this is how this works. Now, a problem, or more than a problem, a fundamental question when you want to buy a coupon is to understand if the price you have been offered to buy the coupon is a fair value. So it makes sense. It's a nice investment for you or not. So what we have to do is typically to compute the price of the coupon by discounting the cash flows generated by the coupon itself. The cash flows will be all the coupons with the different maturities and the final payment that will include the last interest and the capital. Now, let's consider this example. 
imagine that we have a bond with a face value with a par value of hundred dollars that pays five percent per annum semi-annually it means that every year you get five percent but this payment is split into payments so five percent of hundred is five but i get 2.5 2.5 every six months okay this is how it goes what i want to compute is the actual value today of a bond of this type now how can i do that I just have to discount all the cash flows generated by the bond. Now, the first cash flow generated by the bond will be the first payment, the first coupon, $2.5, that I will get six months from now. Okay? So, if you see the formula, what do I have? I have 2.5, that I have to discount on the continuous compounding at what rate? At the corresponding zero rate. From our table, we know that this is 4%. So this is 0 0.04 times what? Time, the time horizon from now until six months, this is 0 0.5 years. So well, the first coupon will be 2.5 exponential of minus 0 0.04 times 0 0.5. Then I will have the second payment, but the second payment will be in one year from now. So I will have to discount that coupon, zero to point five, by the corresponding zero rate, four point three, and the time horizon is one. In that sense, I'm writing there one for clarity, but you can omit it. Then you have the third payment that will be in one point five years, eighteen months. So minus zero point zero two, uh, minus zero point zero five two times 1.5, that will be the argument of your exponential, applied to 2.5. And then, very important, this is a rather, allow me to say, stupid error that I see in the exams. So it's just a matter of attention. At the end, you will have what? Two quantities. The last interest, but also the capital. Okay? Otherwise, here is not a very clever investment. So at the end, what do I have? I have the last interest, which is 2.5, uh, again, the coupon, and the capital, which is the par value, 100. So the last payment will be 102.5. And I will have to discount that. And I discount that according to the corresponding zero rate and the years. Now, if I do my computation with my calculator, with whatever you want, this result is 98.97. That's the fair value of the bond. It means that if I enter in this investment today, this should be the price of the bond. If it is lower, nice. If it is higher, I have to think about that. Obviously, this is the face value, not considering all the possible frictions on the market, taxes, transaction costs, and all the other things, or your strategy, because there can be that for you, even if the price you are offered is higher than this, it's still meaningful. But nevertheless, this is the benchmark. So this is the, the price that you should consider as a benchmark in taking your decision. Now, there is another important interest rate which is not appearing there. So what we see here are four different interest rates that we derived from the, the zero table, so from the zero rate yield curve, if you want. In reality, there is an interest rate here in this formula that is implicit in the sense that it will not appear in this table, it will not appear in this curve. But it's extremely important, and most of the time, it is actually the interest rate with which you play in risk management, also in, in investments. But in risk management, it becomes extremely relevant. And it's called the yield. Now, again, the yield, the yield curve, I know it's people in finance are not very uh, rich of fantasy, so the keep on repeating 
uh, terms and inventing horrible acronyms. What we call the yield is what I was telling you, the implicit interest rate of your investment. It's a particular interest rate, it's a particular average interest rate that applied to the same formula we saw before, so this one, and substituted to the different zero rates still preserves the connection. So this is my investment, I'm discounting all the coupons and the finite capital. This is the price as I have computed it using the zero rates. Now I want to find the variable y, the yield, that satisfies this equation. So it's a, an interest rate that applied to each maturity, and you see the difference with respect to the previous formula. We had different interest rates, different <laughs> zero rates for the different maturities. Here we have the same, and we want to find this value. Now, finding this value is numerically trivial. There is nothing particularly complicated. So there are many possibilities. You can use your calculator, you can use Excel, you can use Python, you can use R, you can use MATLAB, you can use uh, your grandmother, whatever you want. You will get that the result is in this specific case, I'm showing here, for example, the simple code using R with the unit root function. The value that we find is 5.47%, okay? This is the yield, it is the implicit rate that is paid by this coupon, by this uh, coupon bond. Why it is useful? Because it's a, it's a simple summary synthetic measure of the investment. So if I have the yield of an investment and the yield of another investment, it's very simple to, compute, to compare them and to make all my evaluations. Instead of looking at the different maturity structure at the different zero rates, I have a number, okay? Now, the computation of the yield, and we will see the yield over and over again, is not particularly complicated. Numerically, it's actually very simple. Uh, manually, you can still do that. I will never ask you to compute that manually. Um, but remember that it's a very important quantity. When we will now, in a minute, introduce our risk management tools to deal with interest rates, we will typically work with the yield. So we will always consider the sensitivity of our portfolio to the yield, not to the zero rates and all the other formulas. But before that, there is another important topic that we have to cover, which is actually strictly related to interest rates, and is very bank specific. So this is something very important for banks. If you are an ice cream shop, you don't care. But if you are a bank, it's very important. I will always say ice cream shop because I love ice cream. That's the, that's the point, it's the first thing in my mind. So um, it's the concept of net, uh, interest income and net interest margin. Now, if you are a bank, what is your core business? Then we can discuss if it's still true and if they change into something else. But if you are a bank and you had a look at the self-study part, your business is to gather money in form of deposits and lend money to people that want to invest and to buy a house or build a new business, do whatever. So you are an intermediary that got mother money for those that have extra money that they want to invest. And you take that money and give it back to the market in forms of mortgages, loans, whatever. Now, when someone gives you money, so when someone opens a deposit with you, in order to give an incentive to people to give you deposits, you have to pay an interest. Okay, so you pay an interest to those guys. At the same time, if I'm the bank and I lend you money, I want you to pay me some interest. Okay, because money is something that has a cost. And money is never for free. Now, the net interest income is nothing more than the excess between the interest you receive 
and key interest you pay as a bank. <laughs> so the interest you receive, for example, from mortgages and loans, and the interest you pay on deposits. <coughs> we will see over in the course that these interests that you pay and that you receive depend partially on you, on your business strategy, so you can set the interest rate that you want in principle, but most of the time they will be also extremely strongly related to the interest rate set by the central bank or a specific interest rate you've chosen as a reference on the market, okay, like the, the LIBOR <laughs> that now will be changed into something else. The net interest margin is nothing more than the ratio between the net interest income and the income that you have, okay? Um, a fundamental, really fundamental topic for what concerns the management of banks is the so-called asset liability mismatch. It's if you will go in your future career working for a bank, there is a good chance that you can work with something like that. It's a very fundamental topic for a bank, especially for a bank that really does the job of taking deposits and lending money like a retail bank. Uh, now, assume that I have this table. Uh, I just consider two maturities, one year, five years, okay? Just to oversimplify the truth. What I know is if I consider a one-year deposit, so if I give my money to the, to the bank, in one year from now, I will get 3%. And uh, the interest that is paid always on a yearly basis for a five-year deposit is 3%. So exactly the same. So at the end of every year, I get 3%. If, on the contrary, I want a mortgage from the bank, the, the bank will ask 6% in both situations. Okay? One year and five years. To simplify the treatment, assume that our agents, so us, or the people that we are considering, if you are the bank or if you are the regulator, assume that the one-year interest rate is stable over time. It means that if it is 3% next year, it will still be 3%. And in three years from now, it will be 3%. We assume that. It's not true, but it simplifies the, the treatment. Now, here, think of what would you would do, actually. And immediately you see that if you want to deposit your money and the rates are those that we saw in the table, what would you do? Would you prefer to invest in the one-year deposit or in the five-year deposit? Typically, you would prefer the one-year deposit. Why? Because you are fixing your money. You are just giving the money to the bank only for one year. At the end of the period, if you want to reinvest and you actually believe that the interest rate will remain 3%, you will reinvest. So you will roll over your investment. And you will do that for the next years. But at the same time, if for whatever reason, in one year from now, you need the money because you want to buy a house, you are free to do that because you are not linked to a contract of five years. So if you, invest, if you deposit your money, you will tend to prefer the shorter maturity in this situation. Conversely, if you ask for money, so if you ask for money, so you want a mortgage, you will tend to do the opposite. <coughs> you will tend to prefer a longer maturity at the same interest rate. Why? Because it guarantees you that the interest rate for you is fixed at that level. What we were assuming were that short-term interest rate could not change, but still you can be wrong. So over five years, it can be that the mortgage interest rate changes. So if you fix, if you block your contract for five years, you are safe. 
Now, that's it's a problem for a bank. Why? Because what you have is that if you make the oversimplification, I totally agree that a bank takes the money from deposits and lends the money for mortgages and whatever, you have that your deposits are financed by yearly deposits over one year term horizon. Maybe rolled over, but still over one year term horizon. And you are giving your money on a mortgage for five years. So what happens? There is a mismatch between the assets and liabilities. The maturities are not, are not the same. And this is a problem for you because you can encounter problems with your net interest income. How? Imagine that the one-year interest rates are stable or go down, so they fall. Now, this is not a problem for you because you receive 6% from the mortgages and you pay 3%. And if they go down, you pay even less, maybe 26 Okay, but for you is not a problem. You have still a very nice margin. If, on the contrary, one-year interest rates increase, what happens? Your net interest income decreases because if they go to 6%, so they would be the same, our 3% now becomes 6%, there will be nothing for you. So what you pay is what you get. So essentially there is no, no margin. And if they go above, so if they go above 6% for whatever reason, you even have a loss, okay? Because what you receive is less than what you have to pay. So you have a loss. Now, what becomes extremely important for banks is to try, actually, to match, so to reduce the mismatch between the assets and the liability in terms of maturities. Let's consider an exercise. Uh, we consider a bank that has uh, 10 billion pounds of one year and 30 billion pounds of five year loans. These loans are financed, okay, by 35 billion of one year and 5 billion of five year deposits. So now everything is fine. So there is enough money to do all my operations. I know that the equity of the bank is equal to 2 billion and the return on equity is 12%. Totally uh, not credible numbers, but still. Uh, the bank is subject to a 30% tax rate. The question is, what change in the interest rates next year would cause the bank return on equity to be essentially set to zero? to reduce the profitability of the bank to zero. Now, let's see. The asset liability mismatch is 25 billion. If I see the differences in the numbers, what do I see is that 35, 5, 30, 5, and the difference is exactly 25, which is my asset liability mismatch. Uh, the profit after tax I know is 12% of 2 billion, which is the, the equity of my bank. So this is 0 0.25, uh, 24 billion. Now the question is, I observe a, ch a change in the interest rate that I want to express as a percentage. And if there is this change of Y percent, the bank's before tax loss in billion of pounds is what? It is 25 times y times 0 0.01 just because I want to express that as a percentage. So this quantity is 0 0.25 y. Since I know that the tax rate is 30% uh, after paying the taxes, the loss will be 0 0.7 that amount. Okay, so if the 0 0.7 or 0 0.25, so it's 0 0.75 y. The question is, I have to find a y such that this quantity here is exactly this quantity here, which is my profit after tax. If 
I solve for that, I find that the quantity y is 1.37. And this is expressed as a percentage, so it's 1.37%. If all the other conditions remain in the same, check the disparables, there is a rise of 1.37% in the rates that we are considering, then the return on equity of the bank is equal to zero. So, again, to compute the asset liability mismatch, I just compare one-year loans, one-year deposit, five-year loans, five-year deposits, in this very simple second, and I find that this link, essentially this difference is 25 bit. From that, and for the other, uh, obviously, um, information that I have from the problem, I try to find what's, what is the rise in the interest rate, or it could also be a decrease in the interest rate, but not in the second, obviously, given the, the type of asset liability mismatch, that can reduce the return on equity of this year. And I find out that this is 1.37. Now, how can banks try to avoid this? How can they try to fight against the asset liability mismatch? They tend to match assets and liabilities. So we tend to finance short-term loans with short-term deposits and long-term lo loans with long-term deposits. So they try to make that. And in order to do that, what can they do? They can act, at least up to a certain point, on the interest rates. If I want to give an incentive to people to deposit their money for a longer time horizon with me, I can increase the corresponding interest rate. So instead of paying 3%, I will pay 4%. And on the contrary, to give a, the opposite incentive, so a disincentive to people to ask for long-term mortgages, I can increase the rate they will have to pay if they want to enter in that type of mortgage. Or conversely, I can reduce the rate of the short-time mortgages, okay? That obviously are just choices of the bank. But by changing, for example, the mortgage and the deposit structure in this way, I can try to give incentives to people to choose the deposits and the mortgages I, as a bank, prefer. Now, on these type of things, they actually invest a lot of money, try to find systems that monitor the preferences <coughs> of, of clients. Uh, and they also invest quite some money in studying something that in um, economic theory goes under the name of um, liquidity preference theory. So you can imagine that most people, you can say all people, prefer to have liquidity. And in order to block their liquidity in an investment, they need the right incentives, so the right interest rate, for example, if it is a, if it is a deposit, or the, the right expected return if it is another type of, of investment. Playing on these, playing on the interest rates, banks try to reduce the asset liability mismatch. Now, it is so important this topic, that if you consider the last big crisis we observed at the end of the year 2000, so 2007, 2010, if you want, depending on the countries and the continents, there are many situations in which actually the default of important uh, banks was at least partially caused by the asset liability mismatch. Uh, there were, for example, very big problems of asset liability mismatch for Northern Rock in the UK, for Stern in the US, and other banks. Also, some major Dutch banks had problems of asset liability mismatch. And these problems become particularly big during a crisis, okay? Because typically what you see is that the short-term deposits start disappearing because people are not happy to invest their money, they prefer to keep their liquidity, and then the asset liability mismatch problem increases for, for banks. Okay, we stop for the break.